Lifting Up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching Morial TV. Turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 2. Tonight we'll be looking at Mezuzot from the book of Judges chapter 16 at Bryanston at 6 o'clock. But this morning we're looking at fundamentals of ecclesiology, the basic things about body life from the book of Acts. The book of Acts chapter 2. Verse 42, please. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Fundamentals of Ecclesiology There is no model no model in the Bible of the way a church should be organized. There is no model. In fact, in the New Testament alone, there are three distinct and very separate models. We have the model of the primordial church in Jerusalem, this one. We have the later model of the church in Antioch, in Acts 13. And then we have the model in the Greek churches, seen most clearly in Corinth. There is no model. People say it should be like this, and it should be like that, and we should have this kind of eldership, and we should have that kind of ministry, and this kind of service. There is no model. The book of Acts, the New Testament, the Gospels, give us no model. Now, it's partially for this reason. People degenerate into religion. The Old Testament had a model. You'd have a purification ritual, then you'd have a ceremonial reading, then you'd have the, the priests would do this and the Levites would do that. It had to be done just according to the model, to the liturgy. The ordinary liturgy was called the Siddur, from the Hebrew word Lesader, to set in order. And the holidays had a special order called the Makzor. There's something about religion that gives people an artificial sense of security. Now we do this, now we do that, now we do the other thing because it diminishes a sense of personal responsibility. There was a reason there was an order in the Old Testament. To begin with, the purpose of the Old Testament was in large measure to show the futility of religion. That you can't save yourself, you needed somebody to save you. Secondly, in the Old Covenant, only certain people have the Holy Spirit. It wasn't for all who believe like it is now. A bit more about that tonight. Being led of the Spirit was not a possibility, as such, for most people. Thirdly, those rituals that had to take place in that order were shadows, types of what the Messiah would do. There were reasons there was a fixed order in the Old Testament, a model. But there was no model in the New Testament. None. In fact, in the New Testament, again, we see three very different models of the way the churches were organized. People always look, how should we be? Should we do this? Should we do that? No model. No model. What we do have, however, are clear principles, which should be and can be under the direction and leading of the Holy Spirit, applied to any model. 
the model you have will fit your circumstance, your culture. The model you have will fit your circumstance and your culture. Be careful when people try to take their model and put it on other people. That was certainly done in Africa when Europeans bought the gospel. They just bought the gospel, that was fine. But they also bought Western culture and tried to make Western European culture part and parcel of the gospel. Western culture has nothing to do with the gospel. The gospel's for all cultures. There are principles that will be seen in any biblical church. Here at Elijah, I think you will see some of these principles. But in other cases, even in Elijah, some of these principles will be absent. Bearing in mind, at least doctrinally, Elijah is one of the better churches around. Don't think I'm picking on Elijah. The other places are even further. What are these principles that should be found in any church in any model? And you've got Presbyterian systems, you've got charismatic systems, you've got the, all kinds of systems. If God wanted a system, he would have given us one. He didn't give us a system. Didn't give us a model. Didn't give us a liturgy. Didn't give us a hierarchy. Gave us his spirit and his word. In which we find principles. And his spirit will drive, direct us how to apply them. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. The first principle is doctrine comes first. You have three kinds of teaching or preaching in the early church. Three kinds. The first is called kerygma. Kerygma in Greek. Kerygmatic preaching. What is kerygma? Kerygma is evangelism. It's preaching the gospel to unsaved people. The first sermon ever preached in the church was Peter's kerygma on the day of Pentecost in this chapter. Kerygma. The second is homelia. Homelia. We get the word homily. It is exhortation. You're not looking to expound doctrine in depth. You're looking to take a couple of principles of doctrine or a story or a passage or a narrative and use it to encourage the church even though it'll be doctrinally right. But what you have here is the apostles' teaching, the Daskin. The Daskin. The Daskin is the teaching of Jesus. Now, one of the servants of Satan we have in the church today is Paul Crouch from TBN. He actually said on TV in America that doctrine is excrement. No, TBN is excrement. The teaching of Jesus is not excrement. TBN is excrement. It's from Satan. Mammon worship, masquerading as Christianity. The Daskin. Any other preaching has to be based on the Daskin. You can get a pastor who's going to say, well, I'm just going to try to encourage the people, and he'll get a story, and look how God, you know, blessed Jonah, even though Jonah didn't want to do God's will, that's how God will work in our life, and you know. Well, that's fine, as long as what he's saying is in agreement with doctrine. When you see people extracting a story out of the Bible and using it to try to encourage people, to give a homily, but what he's saying is not based on right doctrine, that's wrong. There are people who preach another gospel. The money preachers will say, accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But their definition of lordship and salvation is entirely different than what the Bible means by it. <laughs> They think Satan got the victory on the cross, not Jesus. In a different gospel. The Daskin comes first, the teaching of the apostles. They got it directly from Jesus. But notice they continually devoted themselves to it. They continually were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. How do we continually devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching, that is, the teachings of the New Testament. How do we continually devote ourselves to it? When you are devoted to the teaching, it does not simply mean you agree with it, or that you're devoted to upholding it or defending it. That's a given. 
To be continually devoted to something means you live it out in daily life. What happens in here is irrelevant if it is not put into practical operation out there. What happens when you come to church or what happens when Bill Randalls or Dave Hunt or Jacob Press visit from wherever? It's not important what happens when they come. It's important what happens after they leave. Continually devoted means you live it out. People who say they are Christians, they come to church, they agree with it. Their doctrine is right. What good is it having it up here if it's not here? As a matter of fact, somebody who doesn't have it here, who's ignorant, the people over in Ray's place, a lot of them don't know any better. But somebody who does know better and doesn't live it out, what happens when Christians will come to church and go out and have affairs and get drunk and gamble? Why bother coming? All you're doing is appropriating more judgment unto yourself because you know better. Well, much is given, much is expected. Continually devoted means we live it out daily. We all drop our crosses. The just man falls seven times a day. Christians fall into sin. But they do not habitually practice it and say it's all right when God says it isn't. Doctrine comes first. The Bible puts doctrine, truth, before righteousness. In Ephesians 6, why does the Bible put truth before righteousness? Because if you don't know what's true doctrinally, you won't know what real righteousness even is. You have a false idea of righteousness. The truth comes first. The truth comes first. Oh, we have to have love. As we've pointed out many times, Philippians 1.9, that your love may abound in all knowledge and real discernment. If you don't know doctrine, and if you're not discerning, you can't have love. If you don't have right doctrine, and if you're not discerning, you can't have love. Yeah, we all want love. How do you get love? How do you get a baby? You get married and consummate the marriage. Oh, I want a baby, I want a baby. Well, how do you think you're going to get one? Get married. We want love, we want love. Get the apostles' teaching, get the teachings of the New Testament and put it into application in our lives, we'll get love. <laughs> love Jesus. Continually devoting themselves. Now remember, people here work 12-hour days often. It was a 12-hour work day for most of these people, certainly the locals. 12-hour work day. They didn't have as much time to come to church as we did, we do, but they seem to make it, make it there a lot more often. <laughs> I go to Kenyon May, see a lady from the Kikuyu tribe with a baby on her back in a blanket, walking miles with no shoes on her feet, through the mountains, in the dark, after working all day, come to a Bible study. Puts the baby on her back, walks back, miles, sometimes eight, ten miles. Gets up the next day, washes her own clothes down at the creek, walks a fair distance to get some water, carry on her head, long days, hard physical work, and at the end of the day, she has one thing to look forward to, not a beer in front of the television. Tie the baby on the back in the blanket and walk back to church. Wouldn't miss it for the world. I've got to be honest. I have seen real Christians in Elijah Fellowship. I have seen real Christians in the United States of America. I have seen real Christians in Great Britain. 
I have seen real Christians in Australia. I have seen real Christians in a lot of places. But I have only seen real Christianity in the third world or where the church is persecuted. I have never seen real Christianity in the developed world. The closest I've ever seen to it, believe it or not, tragic as it may be, are people saved in prisons. That's the closest I've ever seen to the real sense of Christ-centered community. Koinonia in the developed world. There are real Christians in Elijah Fellowship. There are real Christians in other fellowships like this in which I speak. There are real Christians. But real Christianity? If you want to see real Christianity, go with David Royal to the Memorial Mission Station in Zululand. See people who, upper middle class in America and England, living with no running water. taking care of babies dying of AIDS. That's real Christianity. Now, I'm not saying we are all called to do that. But we should all be willing to do that if we are so called. <laughs> that was my problem. The Lord called me to the Middle East as a young believer i only been to university, I'd never been to a seminary at that time. And he was calling me to the Middle East to witness to Jews and Arabs, mainly Jews. To the mission field, to a very troubled area of the world. To tell people a gospel they didn't want to hear. People who were inimical, hostile to the message of Christ. They identified Christianity with anti-Semitism. My argument, Lord, you want me to give up my position? I'm making a couple thousand a week, dollars, then, 20-something years ago. Look what I can do for missions and evangelism. Look how much more money I, I can do more staying here in New York and giving all this money to your work. You've got plenty of people to go to the third world and go to the Israel and to go to wherever. Somebody's got to pay for it. I'll make the money and I'll send them. We can always rationalize it. Now, if God told me to stay in New York and make a mint to finance missions, I'd be happy to do that. But my life was not my own. He would say, no, you go. I wasn't an Isaiah, he nanny, send me. I was a send him, I'll send me the bill. <laughs> I like my gold credit card. I like my holidays in Switzerland and taking my girlfriends to the 21 Club. Now, I would do volunteer work in a rescue mission, trying to witness to prostitutes and drug addicts. I would go out with Jews for Jesus and try to witness. I would do everyone. I'd be active. I wasn't a per se lukewarm Christian. And I was always trying to be generous towards the work of the Lord with my money. But when push came to shove, the Lord had to deal with me. And he had to deal with me in the thing that was most painful. Take my life, Lord, but leave the platinum card. I've seen real Christians. But real Christianity? Not here. Not in this place, nor in any place like this place. Now eventually, when I had to begin traveling around the world for ministry and taking Bible study tours to Israel, I had to have a way to get instant access to massive amounts of cash in case I had to fly people I charter a plane. So I went back and I got the platinum credit card again some years later. God eventually told me to go out and get one. But first I had to give it up. 
<laughs> he might give it back to you on his terms. Now I don't have a platinum credit card because I want to impress women. Now I have a platinum credit card because I practically need one for the things God called me to do. <laughs> money is not the issue. It's the attitude towards money that's the issue. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. How can you be continually devoted to fellowship when you're working a 12-hour day? Now, today in the new high-tech economy, people are working longer hours. Companies are outsourcing more. People are becoming self-employed. They're having to chase contracts. They're spending hours on a computer terminal. But the people in the third world and the people in the biblical world always work that hard and harder. Our work is mental. Their work was physical. How can you continually devote yourself to fellowship? To teaching by living it out. How do you continually devote yourself to fellowship? How can you come to church all the time? That's not what it means. Turn to 1 John chapter 1, please. Chapter 1, verse 1 of 1 John. What was from the beginning, and you always see the language of beginning, the language of Genesis is in both John's gospel and his epistle. He's always concerned, again, with this relationship between creation, new creation, and the recreation we talked about yesterday in Bryanston. What was from the beginning we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we beheld, our hands handled concerning the word of life, that's Jesus, but it's also his word, the Bible, the gospel. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, that you also may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. How could you have fellowship with John when he was writing to people far away from where he was. The way you can have fellowship with John, even though you're not with John, is because John was in fellowship with the Father through Jesus. And if you are in fellowship with the Father through Jesus, if the vertical relationship is right, the horizontal one will follow suit. The only way we can be continually devoted to fellowship with each other is if we are all in fellowship with God through Jesus. We can't meet every day all the time. We can't do that. Unfortunately, life is just not like that for most Christians in most places. And the people who've tried to do that by forming religious orders and convents and monasteries wound up sex perverts. It's just not like that. That's not the real world. The only way to have continual fellowship is to have continual fellowship with Christ. When somebody is walking in continual fellowship with Jesus, they will automatically want to be with other believers. They may not be able to do it, but they are very much there in spirit. That mother with the sick child, oh, I wish I could make it to the home group tonight. That physician working the night shift, looking after sick people, I wish I could make it to the Bible study tonight. They're there in spirit. The devil is very good at two things. Trying to put guilt trips on us for not doing what we can't reasonably and giving us lame excuses not to do the things we really can if we tried. If you're in fellowship with Jesus, you'll want to be in fellowship with his people. We've pointed out a number of times 
Hebrews 10, 25, Calva Homer. Forsake not the fellowshipping together one with another, especially as you see the day approaching. If you can't stand together, as we get closer to the last days and the return of Christ, we'll never stand alone. <coughs> Proverbs 18, 1. He or she who remains alone lacks sense. They quarrel against all wisdom. They seek their own desire. When you see people who on the basis, not of legitimate reason, but on the basis of lame excuse, chronically evade fellowship, except for their weekly token bit, the Bible says it's because they're seeking their own desire. They're not seeking to do the will of the Lord. And no matter what reason they give, the Bible says they quarrel against all wisdom. No matter what reason they give, oh, she's this and that one is that and that is one of them. If there is heresy or immorality, don't go to that church, find another one. If you can't find one, meet in a home. But when you chronically evade, and she did this and I don't like that and the spirit is suppressed and they quarrel against all wisdom. The Bible says they seek their own desire. This is not a country club for holy people. It is a hospital for sinners. If you want healthy people, don't find any in a hospital. If they were in a hospital, they're sick. If they weren't sick, they wouldn't be hospitalized. This is a hospital for sinners. That's what it is. What do you find? In a hospital for sinners, you find sinners trying to get well. She offended me. He did this. He did that. He did that. And I'm not going there anymore. I started with They quarrel against all wisdom. They seeketh unto their own desire. If there's immorality, that's unrepentant. Or if there's heresy, I would be the first one out the door. You don't walk out of a marriage. You wouldn't get married if you had any sense on an empty pretense. It's a commitment. Neither do you commit yourself to a fellowship on an empty pretense. It's a commitment. Fellowship. Iron sharpens iron. Thus a man strengthens his friend's countenance. That word in Hebrew for iron sharpening iron is in Hebrew hihuch, friction. What takes place when iron sharpens iron? Friction. The first kind of fellowship God ordained was marriage. Why do opposite personality types attract? in some sense. So there'll be friction. Yes, so there'll also be compliment. One will have what the other lacks. But also, so there will be friction. The Lord brings us into relationships with people who will rub us the wrong way, intentionally, to deal with our old nature, to make both of us more like Christ. Grounds for divorce. The cheap price tag so many Christians have put on holy matrimony is just a natural extension of the cheap price tag so many Christians have put on commitment to fellowship. I'll find another church, I'll find another husband, I'll find another week. This is consumerism, it is not Christianity. It's consumerism. Consumerism in religious packaging. They quarrel against all wisdom. They seek their own desire. Unless there is unrepentant immorality, unless there is adultery with no repentance, there's no biblical grounds for two Christians getting divorced. And unless there is heresy or immorality, 
There was no biblical grounds for dividing a church. By separating yourself from it. They seek unto their own desire. They quarrel against all wisdom. Why will people do things the Bible says don't do? They seek their own desire. They'll try to justify it, but they quarrel against all wisdom. Continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. If you don't want to live it out, don't come because you only make yourself more guilty. Look at the book of Amos. Chapter 4, verse 4, Bethel is the house of God in Hebrew. It's what Bethel means. Enter Bethel and transgress, and Gilgal multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifice every morning and your tithes every three days. Offer a thank offering also from that which is leavened, and proclaim freewill offerings and make them known, for so you love to do, you sons of Israel, declares the Lord. Enter Bethel and transgress. Come to church and go out and get loaded. Come to church, go down to the Wanderers and gamble on a cricket game. Come to church and then go out and get divorced and marry somebody else. Come to church. The structure, the form, the ritual gives us an artificial sense of security that we're right. Oh, I go to church, I pay my tithe. I give to the offering. You offer a thank offering from that which is leavened. Leaven, read 1 Corinthians. Pride, sin, false belief. For so you love to do, you sons of Israel. For so you love to do, you Baptists, you Pentecostals, you Dutch Reformed, you whatever. We love religion. The great delusion. We like a model. God doesn't give us a model. He gives us principles. And if we don't abide by his principles, we don't have Christianity. We have religion. But let's continue. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Now, these were Jews in the first century following this concept of an order. The doctrine comes first. Fellowship comes second. And the breaking of bread comes third. The early Christians had fellowship meals called agapes, love feasts. We got the word for unconditional love. And that's when they take the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is central to our fellowship and our worship. As often as you do this. Now some people have said, like the Jehovah's Witness cult, well, we should only do this once a year at Nisan, because that's when the Jews had the Passover. The apostles said, Christ, our Passover has been sacrificed. In the Greek text of 1 Corinthians, is present continuous active. It's ongoing. The early Christians took the Lord's Supper a lot more than once a year. In fact, at this church, they took it more than weekly. The Reformers came along, and the Reformers had been Roman Catholic priests who read the Bible, and they realized the Church of Rome was an abomination. Luther, Zwingli, Cranmer, they were Catholic priests who read the Bible, and they realized what they had been teaching were lies. One lie being transubstantiation and the Mass, which is cannibalism and idolatry. So in order to distance themselves from the cannibalism and idolatry of the Roman Mass, from the Eucharist, they downplayed the Lord's Supper, and many of the Protestants began taking it every few months, or at the most once a month, or quarterly. You don't correct one error with another error. You correct error with truth. 
The Lord's Supper is central to our fellowship and worship. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We look back and we look forward, the same as the Passover. It is a memorial of what he did, but it is a testimony to what he will do. It is an appetizer of the marriage supper of the Lamb, and it is something more. As we teach on the Passover tapes, it was the way to teach your children. When your children ask you, why do you do this, Exodus 13? Because of the way God delivered us from Egypt. When your children see you taking the Lord's Supper, why do you do this? Well, you accept Jesus and get baptized, you can do it too because of what he did for us. It's a way to teach our children. And it is a way, it is the chief way that God has ordained for saved Christians to prepare for biological death. I long to eat the Lord's Supper with you, but I say to you, I will not take this bread and cup again until we do it in the kingdom of my Father. Husband and wife together, they're getting older, maybe they're retired people or elderly people, and they know one of these days, one of them is going to go be with the Lord. You can always say, the same as we take this bread and drink this cup now. No matter what happens, I wake up dead, you wake up dead. You wake up in heaven. Even if we're separated temporarily by biological death, the same as we eat the bread and drink the cup now, we will eat the bread and drink the cup in the kingdom. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Because of what Jesus did for us, the same as we take the bread and cup together now, no matter what happens, even if biological death should occur, before Jesus comes, we will do it again. It is the way the Lord has given us to emotionally, as well as spiritually, emotionally, prepare for the realities of the temporary separation. It's central. And it's important. If somebody takes the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, they can eat and drink judgment to themselves because they don't discern his body. I don't mean the Catholic Eucharist. But Paul says, for this cause, many fall asleep. You can actually die prematurely. It's important. Doctrine comes first, fellowship second. Why does fellowship precede the Lord's Supper? If you look at the Passover in John 13, Jesus washed the disciples' feet before he ate the Passover. Peter says, Clean all of me. Jesus said, no, you're already clean because of the word. It's only your feet. Once you're saved, once you're born again, you're already clean. It's only our feet that comes in contact with the world. You understand? The ritual of washing each other's feet is does, insignificant. It's what it means. Refreshing each other from our contact with the world. That's what it really means. Most churches will have a coffee time of how, how was your week, uh, Mabel? How was your week, Henry? Or my son is backslidden and my wife is ill. That stuff should take place before we come to the Lord's table. We should encourage and refresh each other from our contact with the world before we come to his table. Then we come to his table. Well, let's push on. End to prayer. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. Nassim Vanifla Ot. What blocks a real move of the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is sovereign. He gives the gifts to whom he wills. We can pray, but we can't coerce. It's not like Rodney Brown from your country. I saw in a video... God, if you don't come down and do this, I'm going to go up there and take it. Not that. We can't manipulate God. We can supplicate, make petition, but we can't manipulate. If you do this, God will have to do that. It's not like that. He gives the gifts to whom he wills. We can pray, we can supplicate. We can't force it to happen. But we sure can 
block it and prevent it from happening. If we do not have principle A, B, C, and D, if we do not have apostolic teaching as the basis, continually devoted to it, continually devoted to fellowship, the central place of the Lord's Supper and prayer, you will block the move of the Holy Spirit. You will prevent signs and wonders, miracles, healings. So what happens when people block it? They go out and counterfeit it. There's no doctrine in these silly raised places or these places. No real doctrine. It's nonsense. It's nonsense. There's one, one of the raised places down in Bloemfontein has a, a man, a preacher, divorced his wife and married another woman as a guest speaker. There's no righteousness, there's no doctrine, there's nothing. But to have all the signs and wonders, no counterfeits. Instead of doing the things you need to do not to block the real, forget that, we'll mimic, we'll hype people up. They're using everything from hypnosis to New Age philosophy, calling that the spirit of Christianity to try to make things happen. They block the real, and then for want of the real, they go out and get a counterfeit. I want to see God move in power when he so wills. And I don't want to block it. And I don't want a counterfeit. I want the real. I don't want a counterfeit, I want the real. And I don't want to block the real. The doctrine's not there, if the prayer is not there, if the fellowship's not there, if the communion is not there, I'm blocking the real. It's always these signs follow. Never the, the signs never come first. Benny and Kenny put the signs first. Jesus Christ never does. And those who had believed were together and had all things in common. They began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. There are those who on this basis have tried to argue that socialism or collectivism or communism is God's model of the socio-economic model. There are those who on this basis try to argue that God prefers some form of Christianized communism. Notice when that went on for a while, God allowed it to be put an end to with the martyrdom of Stephen. What does that tell me? Well, even in the practical world, you see why that works that way. Socialism only works when you're in a country with ignorance and the depth of poverty. Once you get an infrastructure established, the only way you're going to have continued economic growth is through some kind of a free market. Socialism becomes counterproductive long term. It's only a short term vehicle to reduce things like infant mortality and get some kind of a basic thing, a basic infrastructure. Then you've got to ch change gears. Well, the church was the same. There was a right time to live that way. But understand the circumstance. They knew from Daniel and they knew from Jesus Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. If Jesus Christ came to Elijah Fellowship and stood up here and said, listen, get ready to leave this place. The Zimbabweans are going to come and they're going to destroy Johannesburg. It's all going. Wouldn't you put your house on the market? There was a reason they did it. There was a reason they did it. There were other times when they did not live that way. That was not God's leading at that time. No model, only a principle. Are we all called to live this way all the time? No. It's when the need arises and God so leads. We are not all called to live this way all the time. 
but we are all called to be willing to live this way when the time demands it and the Lord so leads. Again, visit the Moriel Mission Station in Zululand. You will find our people living this way. All the money is, that comes from England to support is pooled. They live this way. Nobody has a kettle. We have a kettle. <laughs> they live this way. They live this way. That's the need in that situation. Are we all called to live that way? Not at present. But before Jesus comes back, I expect to see a lot more of it. We're all called to be willing to live that way. And we're all called to stand with those who, for the sake of the gospel, do live that way. Don't get me wrong. I'm not a bleeding heart, but I'm a realist. When I see people coming from Britain and America to live in Zululand, people who have good lives, sacrificially taking care of these AIDS orphans, with a much lower standard of living than they were used to. I knew some of these people from England. And now I see how they're living now compared to where they were living then. I thank God that they're willing to come to South Africa and do that. But certainly, the white middle class and the educated black middle class Christians should be standing with them in prayer and should be helping to finance that kind of work. Or there's something wrong. Now, I realize in this country, because of the way the ANC is ripping everybody off and trying to redistribute wealth, and people are burned off and they don't like to think this way. That's the world. I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about the body of Christ. Those little kids with, with AIDS couldn't take care of themselves if their life depended on it, and their life does depend on it. No, we don't all live that way, but we all have to be willing to live that way. And I speak from my own experience. And day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. Once more, day by day, continuing, continually, continue. It wasn't once a week. It was continually. Notice the principle. With one mind. With one mind doesn't mean we all agree should we be singing choruses or should we be singing hymns. With one mind doesn't mean should we continue to meet here or should we go to another place. That's not one mind means. One mind says, you have your view, I have my view. Lord, what's your view? <laughs> you have your perspective, I have my perspective. Lord, what's your wisdom? What do you want us to do? That's one mind, the mind of Christ. Different Christians will see things differently. The ultimate question is, what's the mind of Christ? What's his wisdom? But here's the principle. House to house and in the temple. Notice they met in big groups and they met in small groups. There are things which can only be done in a larger group like this. A larger group like this can make a statement to the community and to people in wacky churches that a home group cannot. A large group like this can invite a visiting speaker and collect enough money to bring a speaker like Bill Randalls from the States or something like that. You can do things in a large group you can't do in a small one. On the other hand, there are things that can only be done in a small group you cannot do in a big one. Fellowship can never take place in a group of this size. 
you will never have real fellowship here. There are too many people. The body is a ministering organ itself. Different members have different functions. There's eyes, teeth, feet. Every Christian is a minister. Every Christian is a priest. Everyone has a ministry, and we're all called to present ourselves as a living sacrifice to a priest. We don't all have the same ministry, but we all have one. And the gifts that God gives you will be this practical equipping for the ministry he's called you to. You will never discover or develop what your gift is. You will never learn how to use your gifts. You will never learn how to understand what your ministry and your calling is in a group this size. If somebody has a gift of teaching, they are never going to stand up here and automatically just begin expounding the word. It'll be like... It'll be like me trying to play a musical instrument in front of somebody. If I'm at home and nobody's around except possibly my wife or daughter, or I'll sit at the piano. The moment I have to try to play a piano in front of people, my, somehow my fingers become disconnected from my brain. I'm just too nervous and too self-conscious. I can't sight read very well anyway. It's easy for me to play by ear. My wife and daughter can do both. I'm just fumbling. Whatever your gift is, whatever your ministry is, it's never going to be discovered. Whatever your gifts are, they're never going to come to the surface in a big group. It'll happen in a small group. There are things that can only be done in a small group. Fellowship, bearing each other's burdens, really meeting each other's needs, getting next to each other and helping each other through difficult times, that will never happen here on a Sunday. That will happen house to house. There's always that relationship between house to house and in the temple. There are things that can only be done in larger groups and things that can only be done in smaller ones. If I had a choice, if somebody, for legitimate reason, could only make it one time to one meeting per week, I would rather see them in a home than in the temple. Now, ideally, it should be both. Ideally, it should be both. Ideally. Who says the Lord's Supper should only be taken periodically? The Bible doesn't. The book of Acts conveys a very different view. So does the epistle of Jude. And who says the Lord's Supper should only be taken in the temple? Now, I accept the fact that there are people who can only come to church for legitimate reasons once a week, and they need the Lord's Supper on a Sunday. But there's nothing in the Bible that says, don't do it in a house. In fact, in the Bible, they did it in houses. Fellowship, koinonia, takes place in small groups. When all the groups come together, spiritual synergy kicks in. You'll get a dynamic. You want to see a place like this take off on Sunday? It will not be any better than the sum total of what happens in the families, in the marriages, in the home groups. Just like in physiology, cellular health makes tissue health. Healthy tissue makes healthy organs. Healthy organs make healthy systems. Healthy systems make a healthy body. Get the marriages right. Get the families right. Get the home groups right. Then when you come together, you'll have critical mass. <laughs> now what happens when you don't do it that way? You want to see what happens? They try to counterfeit it. They try to substitute spiritual dynamic with hype. Go over to Ray's place. That's all it is. You don't have the real move of God? You're blocking it? Well, we'll counterfeit it. You don't have real dynamic? Well, we'll counterfeit it. With hype. 
height doesn't stand long term. Certainly in terms of persecution and hardship, they're house of cards. I've seen these maverick churches drop dead overnight. The airport vineyard in Toronto was going to build a mega palace. I don't think there's any more than 300 people who go there now. Pensacola, Florida? Not thousands of people there anymore. It's split. Nobody goes there anymore. They get real big quick, maverick growth, but there's no foundation. They fall as fast as they grow. God is more interested in getting the foundations right. Once you get the foundation right, you can go as high as you want. Get the foundation right. Continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking your bread into prayer. Stop blocking the move of God. Have a right attitude towards wealth and materialism. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, not religious hypocrisy. Praising God and having favor with all the people. Not the world, but the people. The world is never going to like us unless we're worldly. The only churches the world likes are worldly churches. We're not called that favor in the eyes of the world. But we are called to have favor in the eyes of people. That they'd want what we have. Jesus. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Some people have been saved at Elijah. Some people have been saved. I've met people here who've been saved through hearing my tapes or Bill Randall's tapes or something like that. Some have been saved. Most people who come here have not come here through being saved. They are refugees from lunatic asylum churches. They've come from some of these spiritual whorehouses with crosses on the roofs. Now I accept the fact that there has to be refugee camps for people who've come out of lunatic asylum churches. I accept the fact that there is a need to encourage people who've been burned, financially exploited, ripped off, conned, abused, etc. by bad churches. I accept that. But it's not the first time I'm saying this in Elijah. You cannot build a church on past hurt. You cannot build a church on what's wrong with somebody else. There is a need for that up to a point. But it can't be, we're a self-help group for people who've been hurt in bad churches. It has to be, no, they're getting it wrong, we have to get it right. You understand? It can't just be an introspective self-help group for people who've come out of bad churches. All right, you come out of the bad church, praise God, you've met other people who come out of bad churches, you can encourage each other, now let's get on with it. They're getting it wrong, we've got to get it right, and so far, we have it half right. Now, I'm not denigrating the half that is right. And I'm not saying there's anything of major consequence that's wrong. But it's time to move on. And the Lord was adding to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. I want to see the Lord add to your number. Not just people coming from the crazy places, although I thank God they do. I want to see unsaved people getting saved, being discipled. And I want them to go out and lead others to Christ. Because that's what Jesus wants. That's what honors him. It's the only thing going to please the Lord. It's the only thing going to help them. And ultimately, it's the only thing going to bless us. Day by day. It doesn't say week by week or month by month. Day by day. Walking in fellowship day by day. Day by day. Being devoted to the apostles' teaching day by day. They. Wow. 
what happens in here, in and of itself, is largely irrelevant. It's what happens out there that's the bottom line. That's the way it is. You have reached the fork in the road. This is the juncture. You've heard Dave Hunt and Bill Randalls and Brother Jacob. And people can come and they can lay a right doctrinal foundation and encourage and maybe straighten out some wrong things. And that's good. That's necessary. That's important. But nobody can do it for you. Yeah, there are missionaries coming from England and America to take care of the poor of this country. That's good. But there should be a lot more South Africans. Crossroads, dichotomy, juncture, time for decision. What do you want? What do you want? You want a church? You want a fellowship? Elijah is going to wind up as one of two things. It's either going to wind up what Jesus wants it to be, or it's going to wind up like everybody else. All groups begin right. They all began right. The Methodists began right. The Pentecostals began right. Most of them began right. Look how they've ended up. Do you think we're immune from it? None of us are immune from it. What do you want? What do you want? I'm going to get on an airplane in a couple of days. I'll be back here for next year or something, Lord willing. You're going to be here. What do you want? What do you want? Do you want Christianity or do you want religion? If you want religion, do me a favor. Stop wasting my time and your money. Because people in Kenya want Christianity. I don't come to South Africa to give anybody any religion. I don't like religion. God doesn't like religion. You want religion, waste your money on somebody else. I don't want religion. Jesus doesn't want another religion. The last thing the world needs is more religion. What the world needs, what South Africa needs, what Johannesburg needs, is Christianity. Up till now, you're halfway there. God bless. Thank you.